Uh, I realize time is, a, is an issue, so I'll try and get my Irish brogue to speed up a little bit. Um, so, first of all, thanks very much for asking me to speak about what really is quite an exciting European-based project, and it's an unashamed advertisement for that. Um, first of all, I'll make my disclosures. We, we have, our group has received some research monies from MSD and Covidian, but I'm not discussing any of those products uh, here. My main reason for being here is a non-industry disclosure is that uh, I'm involved with the, and the NASCI Council with the UEMS, which more of which I'll talk to you about in just a few minutes. So when I looked at the August speakers that were on before me, I thought that maybe I might get rid of all the data from my talk and ask for your indulgence. And your indulgence is mainly to put your scientific brains on hold for a moment and take a step back and look at what has happened in this wonderful world of medical and surgical education over the last two decades. So what I decided to do is plan to talk to you about three specific areas. The first was to paint a vista of what the last 20 years has looked like. And I apologize to the continental Europeans here, even though I am representing you, I have to confirm that my biases are from my own training and practice, which were largely based around small islands such as Ireland, England, and North America, just off continental Europe. Really what I'm going to concentrate on, though, is what is known about the delivery of clinical skills across Europe, which actually makes up for very few slides, and then follow up with what NASCI is and the whole project that recently came to fruition. So in terms of that short history over the last 20 years, we've seen tremendous advances in both patient and disease-related factors. These advances have allowed us to operate on our patients <laughs> safely, identify the patients who most need the operations at what time, and deliver that effectively in high volume centers to the large part. And that's where a lot of the argument has recently settled. Regarding the clinical factors, we've been largely uh, looking at the VISTA, and I've deliberately cherry picked some of the high topics that we've discussed earlier today. In the 1990s, probably based on the Libby Zion case in, in North America in 1988, and then the European Working Time Directive, in Europe thereafter. We've talked about training time of service training indexes. We've talked about how much time we have to train the trainees. Then we've talked about the training in itself over the decade from 2000 to 2010. How do we change, not Kalman from the 90s, this is how do we morph probably towards a more North American type residency program as has been seen in the UK and will soon be seen in Ireland. And over that time, over that decade between 2000 and 2010, we've looked at simulation and we've looked at it extraordinarily scientifically. We've sought to evaluate it, we've sought to see whether it works and what works. We've looked at simulators themselves and tried to validate them in a variety of different ways. But overall, we've been really searching for the role that simulation should have within our training curricula. And that role is beginning to become clarified recently. I look forward to the talk from Professor Guande because he has represented the popularization of looking at surgical performance. That is not just in the operating theater, in fact, medical performance. And he has written books that are popular not only to medical practitioners and surgical practitioners, but to the public as a whole. And that has reflected what society has demanded, not only surgical society, but also what society in general has demanded. And there have been excellent projects in that uh, decade between 20 uh, 2020, uh, 2000 and 2010, such as the projects that we've heard about today, which have come to fruition, fruition whereby the ISCP now have instigated, as we've just heard, the simulation program into it. This has been coupled with uh, units such as our own trying to develop assessment tools which will fit more than just one particular audience. And Marie Morris, in our unit, who's leading the fMRI project, which is taking on surgeons, looking at them doing tasks, and A, seeing if they have a brain, and you'll be pleased to know that they do, uh, but B, trying to work out a construct for that, not only for uh, specific surgical tasks, but for a variety of different trainees, both expert and non-expert. The training time argument, though, hasn't gone away. It's still very present. The training time argument is still uh, very uh, key in, in, in Ireland in particular, and we've recently had a trainee strike. And as you can see from the glum faces on all the trainees, there is a myriad of different uh, problems there at the moment, apart from this chap just above, where you can see he's smiling, and I'm not entirely certain why, but in general terms, the training time argument is still there. 
I decided to put one sports reference in, and had I realised that the, the previous speaker's uh, sports reference would be rugby, because I thought rugby union wasn't a, a big thing uh, in, in the north of England, um, I, I would have put in the championship winning side from the Six Nations, but unfortunately I left that slide at home, so please forgive me. But this slide basically is to remind me that I took my son, my 70-year-old son, who unfortunately I've inflicted a, a great disease on him in that he now follows Tottenham Hotspur. And as we went over to watch them thrash Fulham recently, I picked up the paper. And being a seven-year-old, he's, he's doing well with his reading, and he asked me what this paper said. And the, the, the basic message after telling him what the EU was was that there are still fears with regard to surgical training. And although we've moved a long way along the diffusion of innovation curve, in that we're nearly at the end where only the laggards are resisting the implementation of, skin, uh, of skill centers and, and simulation-based training within curricula, we still are, are up at a point where radical change is still needed to try and um, uh, formalize the role of skill, skill centers across Europe. So that begs the obvious question. What do the skill centers across Europe do now at the moment? And the answer, in short, to you today is we don't know very well. We do not have a good network of skill centers. We do not have a good data, even for, on a country level, to try and work out what individual skill centers are uh, doing. So when we talk about Europe, in fact, it's not a European issue, it's a worldwide issue that we do not know what the individual skill centers within the countries are doing. And although we're much better now about trying to develop the metrics to see whether those skill centers are working and are efficacious, we still don't know what they look like overall. My own practicing country in Ireland, Oscar Trainer, who's in the audience, has led the, um, and pioneered the national training program. And it's much easier in Ireland because we're dealing with a population of 4 million. So all of our trainees now rotate through a centralized skill uh, center. However, there's a myriad of different incarnations of that, and as we move more towards mobile technology, I presume the skill centers will themselves become more mobile, ranging from single rooms and hospital-based things to big, magnificent centers that are off-site but still perhaps have university affiliation. But the basic line to all of this is the heterogeneous provision of those skill centers. We in our own group have actually looked at the uh, certification in Europe and indeed beyond Europe. And we, we were shocked at how difficult this project was to try and work out what the baseline standards are. And here, you'll hear more of that from Amy Gillis tomorrow. So really, what I'm here standing up in front of you today is present the work of others. And it's about NASCI, which is a UEMS-based project, largely uh, uh, incepted and delivered by Anders Bergenfeld. A lot of you will know Anders as an as a, uh, uh, associate editor of the BJS. And Anders sits on the UEMS section of surgery as the, the, the NASCI chairman, which has recently been constituted. His basic idea, which was very aptly and, and well supported by Vasilios, and uh, we thank the president of the UEMS uh, section of surgery for that, uh, based on European-based accreditation of skills centers. The steering group was conveniently in Lund, where Anders actually works. And we all trekked across there over the last 18 months to put this all together. And it initially started as a project within the section of surgery, but has morphed into something much greater. It's morphed into a multidisciplinary joint committee, which means that it sits over not only the section of surgery, but also anesthesia and beyond. Initially, we, we, we looked to credit three separate levels of skill centers. But the third level is going to be in the second phase or second iteration. So I'll concentrate on the first two. What those two centers look like are, are very simple. One is a multi-specialty center which will deliver skills-based training to a wide variety of disciplines and sub-disciplines. The idea of that center is that it will have an all-singing, all-dancing center which will allow us to train the trainers and, and really uh, focus research and development for that region or country. The second uh, type is a single specialty format center which will be slightly less than the multi-specialty format but will be no less valuable in its own right. And the idea is that NASCI, the group itself, will accredit the center, but not the content. The content is dealt with in other UMS uh, functions. The organization has recently been constituted uh, 
at the uh, meeting in Rome there just earlier this month and the UEMS has ratified it. So it is up and running and we hope we look to be accepting our first round of accreditations later on this year. The governance and all the other headers that we will be accrediting under has been well developed and is available now on the website. And I'm not going to spend, for time reasons, any time on the next few slides apart from briefly overlying them. We believe the governance of these centres probably to be the most single, most important factor within these headers that we will look at. And there needs to be robust governance. Perhaps this accreditation progress, uh, process can actually be used to take to governance to secure better funding. But as you can see, there are a, a, a significant amount of bars that need to be jumped over before the, the centre can be accredited. That these are not only governance but administration based. And we haven't forgotten about obviously the teachers and in fact the learners, the whole reason around these skills centres in terms of developing standards for them that need to be uh, uh, met for accreditation. Research and development probably is the single most important factor of what these centres can, on the, the network can actually deliver. And when we talk about the process of accreditation, really what we're looking at is to develop a network as quickly as possible. There will be obviously cost implications for the centres with regards to how you will accredit and how you will keep the NASCI uh, membership going forward. But that membership looks to give back directly to those members. I've listened to a lot of wonderful talks today and exciting talks about what the future holds for us all. But one note kept, was, was something that, that kept striking a chord with me in that there is a lot of people doing a lot of very good works and apart from conferences such as ICASET, these works are largely going unheard of apart from very specific points in the education calendar and wouldn't it be wonderful to have a network which would allow free-flowing ideas to happen in a more um, uh, timely and quick fashion. So Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me briefly today. Uh, what, I, what I hope you see is that in Europe the marriage between simulation centres and the training curriculum is becoming clearer. We have made significant processes and progresses over the the last two decades, but more needs to be done, and that building a network provides more speed for development of the future. And I would be very grateful if you would check out the website, which, will be, which is live, and the call for accreditation will be going out in a couple of months' time. Thank you very much.